Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Hi, my name is Cynthia, and I'm a child of God, and I'm here to share with you the gospel, which is the good news. It's the most important message in any of my videos, in any of our lessons, in any of our studies. The most important message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. God is holy, without sin, and righteous. He is just. Psalms 99 verse 9 tells us, For the Lord our God is holy. We are all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. We all deserve death and separation from God due to our sins. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death. But the good news it tells us that God loves us even though we are sinners. God has given his only begotten son in order to pay for our sins. Jesus Christ died in our place and rose from death. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 through 4. Heaven is a free gift for sinners. We receive this gift only by faith and only through Christ. It is not a reward for people who do good deeds or good things, good works. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. God promises us, that whoever believes only in his son, Jesus Christ, for salvation can know with absolute certainty that they have eternal life. 1 John 5, 11 through 13 says, And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. God promises us that we can never lose our salvation. God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, are who keeps us saved. Verses 28 and 29 goes on to tell us, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So would you accept the fact that you deserve hell, since that is God's judgment? But at the same time, God loves us in such a way that he has given his Son to die on the cross in our place. Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins, so by simply believing in him instead of our good works, we can be saved. If you trust in Jesus Christ alone to obtain the gift of salvation, God guarantees that you are eternally secure in him and you will be with him forever in heaven. Are you ready? Are you ready to meet God? In comparison with this question, all others are utterly insignificant. You may be successful in business, have a wonderful family, and be healthy in both body and mind, and you may even be religious and respected by all. But can you say with a certainty that you are ready to meet God? To be ready to meet God requires a new birth. Jesus said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, verse 3. And this statement has no exceptions. It cannot be ignored, as it was given by the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you been born again? The need for new birth arises from the fact that we are all sinners by birth and by practice. Sin is contrary to the nature of God. 
He hates sin and it keeps us from having fellowship with him. The Bible declares that God is of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. But while God hates sin, he loves sinners. In fact, he loves us whether we walk the clean or the filthy side of the road to hell. Because he loves us, he has provided the way for us to be restored to fellowship with him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. God's judgment for sin fell upon Christ on the cross, and there is cleansing and forgiveness for all who believe on him. As many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God. To those who believe in his name, John 1, 12. I am a child of God. Are you a child of God? Through new birth, by receiving Christ, by believing he died for my sins, I am born into the family of God. And I can answer the question, are you ready? With a glad and confident, yes, my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Have you known this change? Have you experienced this new birth? Have you turned to God in repentance, admitting that you are a sinner in need of salvation? And have you given up the false idea that you can earn God's favor through your own good deeds or good works by keeping all of the command, Ten Commandments? Do you think that you can live a perfect, sinless life? I'm pretty sure you've already failed. And those failures... need to be paid for. Your good works will not cover them, but the blood of Jesus Christ will. Because he died for our sins, he took the punishment on himself. So you have, you need faith. Um, you, you by faith need to accept the free gift of salvation that Jesus Christ is offering you. There's no strings attached. Believe in him. Trust in him. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. <sighs> what Jesus offers you, forgiveness of sins and eternal life with him in heaven, is of infinite value. The terms are simple. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 3.23 So receive Jesus, the living Christ of God who died rose again, and now offers salvation to all who believe on him. Trust in him now as your very own Savior. It's not the reception of a creed or identification, uh, identification with the church or becoming a religious person that saves. It's the acceptance of a person, the Son of God. Your acceptance or rejection of him answers the question, are you ready? It is appointed for men to die once, but other, th but after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9.27, when you stand before God, will you be stained with your sin or will you have been washed clean through the blood of Jesus Christ, through your faith in Jesus Christ? This, very is this issue is very clear. Your response to Jesus now will determine your destiny for eternity. Acts 4. 12 and 1631 says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You put your faith and your trust in him, in his finished work on the cross. I believe full heartedly that Jesus, who is God, came down to this earth. He was born into the flesh of humans. He was born a very humble birth. And he grew up and he lived a perfect, sinless life. He did nothing wrong. He was the innocent sacrifice needed for the forgiveness of our sins. He died on that cross for our sins. He rose again on the third day. And he's coming back for us very soon in a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe it. It's going to happen. We are seeing the signs today. We know that we're in the end days. We know that the tribulation is coming. And if the tribulation is coming, we are that much closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ and the rapture. Because the second coming happens 
after the seven year tribulation, the time of trouble that's going to come on an unbelieving, unrepentant world. The rapture is going to happen before the tribulation because we are not appointed to wrath. So, interestingly, the book of Revelation is the 66th book of the Bible, and six is the number of man. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is telling us what to expect and what is coming. But when I talk about the rapture, you know, a lot of people say, oh, the rapture is not in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. The, the rapture is not there. I, you're, non-believers will say you're putting too much stock in um, chapter 4, verse 1, calling that the rapture. But I want to tell you something. I believe the rapture is in the church. So in the book of Revelation, and yes, we're going to be talking about Jonah and the um, coming eclipse. We're going to talk about the coming eclipse and some new information that I haven't shared yet um, about this eclipse that I think is relevant and we need to talk about. And then we're going to talk about how Jonah foreshadows, foreshadowed Jesus Christ and what meaning does that have for us today? Um, so stay with me, but the Holy Spirit has put this message on my heart. And I want to just point out to you that the rapture is in the book of Revelation. You just need to know how to search it out. It is the honor of kings to search out a matter. And we're going to look at this real quick. Um, so... The book of Revelation. A lot of people talk about the symbology in it, the symbolism. They don't want to read it. They don't want to understand it, but it, it can be understood. So we're going to look at the lampstands and the churches. Um, a lampstand is an appropriate symbol for a church because a church's responsibility is to help enlighten its members regarding God's will and to shed the light of the gospel into a spiritually and morally dark world. And the world that we're living in today is becoming increasingly dark. Seven lampstands burn on earth, sending their light throughout the earth as a burning witness and testimony of the risen Christ. Then the church is raptured. And John sees seven torches or lamps burning before the throne in heaven as a multitude which no man can number worships God and the Lamb. One spirit seen in diversity in both earth within the church and in heaven before the throne after the rapture. One divine spirit um, burning in diverse activity activates angelic judgment from Christ upon the throne of God. Um, and also energizes the body of Christ in a fiery testimony. Again, as from Christ, seated on the throne of his Father, we see the seals opened, and we will be there with him when that happens. Why do I say that? <laughs> well, let's look at some of the scriptures in Revelation. Revelation chapter, chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks are one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now here, John is on the earth, and he's seeing seven golden candlesticks, and one like unto the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, standing in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Now, when you look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, they tell us who the candles. We, we learn who the candlesticks are. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven, um, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So right there we know, here on earth, we've got seven candlesticks burning and Christ is in the midst of them. And then 
the mystery of the seven candlesticks are the seven churches, the believers in Christ here on the earth. Now, interestingly, John goes on and he, there's letters to each of the churches. Um, I'm going to share with you chapter 3, verse 10 uh, through 11. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. We are kept from the trial that's coming. And it's coming on the whole earth. Now, there's much more to say about these letters, and you should read them. It's very interesting, and it is a message that is relevant to us today. However, we're going to go to chapter 4, the rapture verse in Revelation. So, chapter 4, verse 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. After what? After his letters to the churches. So, we're talking about the church age through chapters 1 through 3. And then after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you these things which must take place hereafter. After what? After the church age. After the church. The age, the, the age of grace. Right there, when he's saying, there's a trumpet which says, come up hither, that is the rapture. And so John was in, um, immediately was in the spirit and he immediately saw a throne in heaven and he saw the one who sat on the throne in cha uh, verses, chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. But now we're going to look at chapter 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, of course, we could talk about the elders, but that's not what I want to discuss um, right now. We're looking at the seven candlesticks. And so verse 5 goes on, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. There they are. That's us. We're the church. One of the first things he saw when he was raptured up in the spirit, um, when he came before the throne of God, now we're in heaven and the seven, the seven lamps of fire are burning there before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And so that's very interesting. First thing he sees when he gets up there is the church, the seven lampstands burning before the throne of God. So yes, I do believe that the rapture is in the book of Revelation. And if you look, when you look into God's word, you can search these matters out for yourself. The thing is, people aren't reading the Bible anymore. We're living in the times when the books are being opened. Um, they were sealed in Daniel's time. Today they've been opened. And so many aren't watching. So many aren't looking. This, this eclipse that's coming, we've talked about it before. And um, we've talked about it many times. It's amazing what God is showing us through these signs. We could talk about so many things that are happening in the world today in regard to prophecy, the lawlessness that we're seeing, the wars and the rumors of wars, what we're doing to the children, what's happening to our children. We could talk about New Babylon, which I believe is America. We could talk about how the Bible's being perverted, how people are falling away from the faith. We could talk about AI and technology, <coughs> but today I want to talk about Jonah. So the, this eclipse that's coming on April 8th, 2024, um, there's many 
many signs associated with it. I mean, we've got the elf in the top, the signature of God across America. He's literally put his signature on America. We um, know that there's an intersection at Little Egypt. We've already, I mean, through many studies, we know that there's seven Salem's and seven Nineveh's. There's a town called Jonah in Texas, um, and there's a town called Rapture. Um, the deeper you look into these eclipses, the more obvious the um, these connections are. There's so much, so much, but we're going to talk today about um, a few things that I haven't mentioned yet, because I know that not all of my viewers are um, subscribed or watching the other Watchmen, the Watchmen community. So I feel neglectful to not bring this up. But in 2017, there was the Great American Eclipse. That went from Oregon to Corpus Christi, Texas. Now on April 8th, there is a Great American Eclipse scheduled, um, scheduled to go through um, Eagle Pass, Texas, from, from Eagle, Eagle Pass, Texas to Maine. It is a total eclipse the entire way it's on its entire path, it will be total, not partial. Of course, now, when you look at that, um, you know, like say here in Minnesota, I'm going to see a partial eclipse. I don't get to see the total eclipse, but the eclipse that goes across the United States will be total in the path of totality. You will see a total eclipse. And you can say, so what? Well, as so many are, people are going just, they're, going to watch it they want to go see it this is for for many this is just a great great um view of uh astronomical event but the 2017 eclipse entered the country over the cascadian subduction zone and then it went over yellowstone and crossed over the new madrid subduction zone before leaving the eclipse in 2023 entered over the Cascadian also, and then it flowed over the Balcones fault line before leaving Texas. Now, the April 8th eclipse next month will enter Texas going over the Balcones line. Then it travels over the new Madrid subduction zone before going on up to New England. The 2017 and 2024 eclipse um eclipse in April, will cross into the new, will, they're going to cross um, like a conjunction intersect in the new Madrid zone. So we have three eclipses tying together two subjunction zones, one fault line and an ancient volcano. And although close but not intersecting with, uh, we can't leave out the San Andreas fault either. Um, but did you know that there is a crack in the Earth's surface? Some have called this the uh, 1700 mile crack, um, but it goes from the New Madrid up through Washington state, going right through Yellowstone. Did you know that? And also a crack going from the New Madrid Northeast, just missing the Great Lakes and into Canada. And right along the April eclipse path. Now, interestingly, um, these are the, 2017 eclipse and the April 8th, 2024 eclipse. It's six years, six months, six weeks, six days since the 27th, the April 28th, 2020. Next month's eclipse is six years, six months, six weeks, and six days since the 2017 eclipse. And it's 40 days before Pentecost. Now, I love that the book of Revelation is the 66th book. And by the way, as I said already, Number six is the number of man. So if for some reason the April eclipse activates New Madrid and there is a catastrophic earthquake much worse than the ones of 1811 and 1812, what will happen to America? Would this set off a chain reaction of New Madrid, Yellowstone, Cascadia, the Balkans, San Andreas, and two majorly long cracks in the surface of the earth, in the path of the great eclipses. Revelation 22 verse 13 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last.
and we have the elf and the toff spelled out across America through these eclipses. I don't believe it's a coincidence. God is giving us our last warning. I truly believe that. Am I saying that the rapture is going to happen during the eclipse? No. I personally think that Pentecost is looking pretty good if you're into date setting. Um, but because it's 40 days after the eclipse and Nineveh was given 40 days to repent. Is America being given 40 days to repent before the rapture of the church? I could be completely off. The rapture could happen during the eclipse. I don't know. I expect that there is going to be earthquake activity. Um, after this eclipse, I'm, we're, I don't know what it means, but I do believe it's a warning from God. And I believe that interesting things are going to be happening very soon. I believe it's a warning. And when God gives us a warning, wouldn't you think he also gives us time to change our minds, to repent and to choose him? The Watchman community is warning you well in advance. And now we're about to see something amazing in the skies. And you know, that's not the only thing happening. Um, the devil comet. Could this be the Ephesians red star? Could this be Wormwood or something much more sinister? If you haven't heard, I, I've spoken of the devil's comet before, but during the eclipse, seven planets will be aligned. Uranus, Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, Neptune, Saturn, and Mars will all be lined up with the sun and the moon during this eclipse. Could this be the seven heads of Revelation 12, verse 3? The devil's comet got its name because of fiery explosions that um, give it the appearance of having horns. It has a fiery green tail, and it has exploded many times, four to five times already. It's coming closer and closer to our sun, so we can expect more explosions possibly from this comet, and it will be visible during the eclipse next month, depending on where you are, I suppose. But this is going to be an eclipse that is visible, and it's going to go through to, um, I don't remember, um, Passover? or Pentecost, I think it goes up, you'll be able to see it in the sky, visible uh, for a while. And I believe it's it might be right before Passover that it's at its high, its peak. Um, it's at its peak viewing the day before Passover. Anyways, um, this is not, you're going to have the seven, the seven planets lined up. This eclipse is going to happen, a solar eclipse over America. And the Devil's Comet is going to be vis um, visible for many during that exact moment. This is not a coincidence. It's, it's just not. I have two great verses for you. Let me just clear a little spot. I've got my Bible in my... Okay, so... I have two great verses for you. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. And Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 through 4. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Forget fire and brimstone prophets. Jonah's story, Jonah, Jonah's story is a blend of adventure, um, laughs, and something deeper. A whisper of the gospel tucked away in the Old Testament. Imagine a shipwreck, not of wood and waves, but of preconceptions. On the surface, it's a hilarious disaster. Jonah fleeing God on a one-way ticket to, Tar to Tarshish swallowed by a great fish, and spat back onto dry land, seagulls squawking and seaweed clinging, the whole shebang. He went to Joppa and bought himself a ticket to Tarshish one way. He gets swallowed by a giant fish, and he gets spat back on dry land. <sighs> Interestingly, Joppa is one of the cities that this eclipse is going to go over. But 
the name of a city that this eclipse is going over next month. But beneath the surface lies a treasure. This isn't just about a grumpy prophet and his fishy misadventures. It's about God's relentless pursuit, a love that refuses to be quenched by disobedience or swallowed by the depths. I mean, picture this. Jonah, grouchy and grumbling, is thrown overboard, a sacrifice to calm the storm he caused. But God doesn't let him drown. He sends a giant sea creature to ferry Jonah to the Ninevites, whom Jonah dreaded preaching to. And here's the kicker. The Ninevites, those notorious bad guys, they repent. They dust off their sandals. They get down on their knees and they turn their hearts inside out. They sit in ashes and they wear sackcloth, everyone in the city. But Jonah was not thrilled. He'd rather the city crumble than see God offer grace to his enemies. And that's where the whisper of Jesus becomes a shout. Jonah's story isn't just about God's relentless pursuit. It's about his boundless grace. It's a foreshadowing of the ultimate act of love. Jesus willingly swallowed by darkness the tomb and spat back into the light during the resurrection um, to offer salvation to all. Imagine a prophet um, more comfortable with pronouncements than palm trees. A man named Jonah would rather preach to pigeons than the notorious Ninevites. Ninevite wasn't exactly the spiritual oasis of the ancient world. It was the capital of Assyria, Israel's sworn enemy, a city wreaking violence and pagan worship. So when God calls Jonah to deliver a doom and gloom message to these folks, Jonah does what any sensible yet disobedient prophet would do. He runs. His resistance wasn't just geographical. It stemmed from a mixture of fear and prejudice fear of the unknown, venturing into enemy territory, and God's unpredictable mercy. Ninevites were the other, the ones Jonah had been taught to despise. The thought of them repenting and receiving God's grace challenged his ingrained worldview, threatening his sense of tribal identity. Jonah's story isn't just about a temperamental prophet or divine detour. It's a mirror reflecting our blind spots, the prejudices that lurk beneath the surface in our hearts. We too can be quick to judge and slow to offer grace, especially to those that we deem different. And Jonah's journey becomes a cautionary tale, urging us to confront our biases and embrace God's radical inclusivity. So you fast forward to the belly of the beast, trapped in a watery tomb. Jonah grapples with his disobedience and God's persistent love. His prayer emerging from the depths of despair echoes themes that would later resonate in the teachings of Jesus. Consider lines like, um, from the depths, I cried out to you, Lord, in Jonah chapter 2, verse 2, a clear foreshadowing of Jesus' cry from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. And Jesus, like Jonah, was swallowed by darkness, the tomb, and spat back into the light, the resurrection. Both stories showcase God's willingness to descend into the depths of human suffering, offering love and redemption where we least expect it. The book of Jonah wasn't just a bedtime story for ancient Israelites. Um, Jesus referenced Jonah as a sign to his generation in Matthew 12, 39 through 41. He compared Jonah's experience in the fish to his, entombed, um, to his entombment and resurrection, offering Jonah's story as a foreshadowing of the ultimate act of salvation. <coughs> the phrase, sign of Jonah, was used by Jesus as a typological metaphor for his future crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. Jesus answered with this expression when asked by the Pharisees for miraculous proof that he was indeed the Messiah. The Pharisees remained unconvinced of Jesus' claims about himself, despite his having just cured a demon-possessed man who was both blind and mute. 
Shortly after the Pharisees accused Jesus of driving out demons by the power of Satan, they said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Matthew twelve thirty eight through forty one. To fully appreciate the answer that Jesus gave, we must go to the Old Testament book of Jonah. In its first chapter, we read that God commanded the prophet Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh and warn its people that he was going to destroy it for its wickedness. Jonah disobediently ran from the Lord and headed for the city of Tarshish by boat. The Lord then sent a severe storm that caused the crew of the ship to fear for their lives. You know, the crew that were in fear of their lives, they came to learn about God through Jonah. But Jonah was soon thrown overboard and swallowed by a great fish, where he remained for three days and three nights. Jonah chapter 1 verse 15 through 17. After the three-day period, the Lord caused the great fish to vomit Jonah out onto dry land. Jonah chapter 2 verse 10. Um, it is this three days that Jesus was referring to when he spoke of the sign of Jonah. Jesus had already been producing miracles that were witnessed by many. Jesus had just performed a great sign in the Pharisees' presence by healing a deaf man who was possessed of a demon. Rather than believe, they accused Jesus of doing this by the power of Satan. And Jesus recognized their hardness of heart and refused to give them further proof of his identity. However, he did say that there would be one further sign forthcoming, his resurrection from the dead. This would be the final opportunity to be convinced. Now, Jesus' paralleling of the Pharisees with the people of Nineveh is telling. The people of Nineveh repented from their evil ways. Jonah chapter 3, 4 through 10. After hearing Jonah's call for repentance, while the Pharisees continued in their unbelief, despite being eyewitnesses to the miracles of Jesus, Jesus was telling the Pharisees that they were culpable for their unbelief, given the conversion of the people of Nineveh, sinners, who had received far less evidence than the Pharisees themselves had witnessed. And interestingly, from the time of Jonah's preaching, the people of Nineveh had 40 days to repent. And they did, sparing their city from destruction. From the time of Jesus' preaching, the people of Jerusalem had 40 years, but they did not repent. And Jerusalem was destroyed. But what are we to make of the phrase, three days and three nights? Was Jesus saying that he would be dead for three full 24-hour periods before he would rise from the dead? I mean, it does not appear so. The phrase three days and three nights need not refer to a literal 72-hour period. Rather, according to the Hebrew reckoning of time, the days could refer to three days in part or in whole. Jesus was probably crucified on a Friday, Mark 15:42. According to the standard reckoning, Jesus died at about 3 p.m., Matthew 27, 46, on a Friday, which would have been day one. He remained dead for all of Saturday, day two, and he rose from the dead early Sunday morning, day three. Attempts to place Jesus' death on Wednesday to accommodate a literal 72-hour period are probably unnecessary once we take into account the Hebrew method of reckoning of each day as beginning at sundown. So it seems that the expression three days and three nights was used as a figure of speech meant to signify any part of the three days. God would often use signs or miracles in the Bible to authenticate his chosen messenger. The Lord provided Moses with several miraculous signs in order to prove others that he was appointed by God. Exodus chapter 4, 5 through 9, 7, chapter 7, verse 8 through 10 and 19 through 20. So God sent down fire on Elijah's altar during Elijah's contest with the prophet of Baal, the prophets of Baal. First Kings 
through 39. He performed this miracle to prove that the God of Israel was the one true God. And Jesus himself would perform many miracles or signs to demonstrate his power over nature. Not even everything that Jesus did was written down because there was too much to write. He did so many things. Now the sign of Jonah would turn out to be Jesus' greatest miracle of all. Jesus' resurrection from the dead would be God's chief sign that Jesus was Israel's long-awaited Messiah, Acts chapter 2, 23 through 32, and established Christ's claim to deity in Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 4. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John provide some of the most interesting reading in all of the Bible. They are filled with eyewitness testimonies of the person and work of Jesus. The Gospels are an excellent starting place for any new Christian or anyone exploring Christianity. Um, I like to direct people to the, the book of John to start there. If you're just starting your Bible studies and you've never read the Bible, start with John. But one of the most attractive elements in the Gospels is the many stories that fill their pages. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John convey who Jesus is and what he did by telling stories. And another element that is particularly intriguing to me is the way that the gospel writers make use of the Old Testament. Whenever I read the gospels, my eyes are always opened to the crystal centricity of the Old Testament. In the gospels, the reality has come and the shadow of the Old Testament can properly be seen and more fully interpreted. One example of the excellent storytelling element and use of the Old Testament element can be found in Mark 4, 35-41. In this passage, Mark tells the story of Jesus calming a storm. And this is the way that Mark tells his story. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, Jesus, um, just as he was. I'm sorry, I'm going to start that over. So on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with, him, with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling but he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Not only can we appreciate this amazing story that causes both child and adult to marvel, we can see numerous, almost eerie parallels to an Old Testament prophet. In fact, scholars contend that the language used by Mark is nearly identical to the language of the account of Jonah. I see about seven parallels between Jesus calming a storm and Jonah being swallowed by a whale, though there may be many more. Both Jesus and Jonah were in a boat. Both boats were overtaken by a storm. Both storms are described in almost exactly the same way. Both Jesus and Jonah were asleep. Both groups of sailors wake their passengers with the fearful statement, we're going to die. Both situations included divine intervention over nature as the sea was calmed. Both groups of sailors grow more terrified after the storm was, cal um, was calmed. So that's seven clear parallels. One major difference, or so it seems, Mark's story ends after Jesus calms the storm with a word. However, in Jonah's account, he says to his sailors, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Jonah chapter 1 verse 12. Jonah basically says, if I die, you will live. Even though we don't see this penal substitu 
substitutionary element directly in Mark's account of Jesus calming the storm, when viewed in the broader context of Mark's gospel, we do see another parallel. Later, Jesus would come to a cross to face the greatest storm of all, the wrath of God against our sin. Jesus is the greater Jonah, as he is thrown into the tempest so that we might live. In the words of Tim Keller, Jesus was thrown into the only storm that can actually sink us, the storm of eternal justice, of what we owe for our wrongdoing. That storm wasn't calmed, not until it swept him away. The most crucial element in these two texts is how both of them so beautifully sing the doctrine of penal substitution. In other words, the cross of Christ is on full display as Jonah goes overboard and as Jesus calms the storm with his words. He foreshadows the coming storm. He would calm by being tossed deep into the heart of it. So when you feel that God has left you alone in the storm of your life, remember that he cares infinitely more than you could ever imagine. If God did not leave you alone in the ultimate storm of sin, then you can trust him to be with you during the smaller storms in your life. Jonah offers himself as a sacrifice in order to save the other men on the ship. He has no idea what will happen to him when they hurl him into the sea, but he does know that he's the reason God has caused the storm to come upon them. For all Jonah knows, he may drown in the waters of the deep. However, God appoints a great fish to swallow Jonah. The fish saves him from drowning. Jonah spends three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. The whole situation gives Jonah time for self-examination. He reassesses the call God made to him that he should call Nineveh to repentance. He realizes that he cannot flee or hide from God and must do what he has been called to do, even if it costs him his life. While in this fish's belly, Jonah prays to the Lord. He compares being tossed into the sea to being cast into Sheol, the place of the dead. He recognizes that God answered his prayers of deliverance by saving him from drowning. <sighs> Even in the belly of the fish, he tells the Lord, You brought my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Jonah chapter 2 verse 6. He trusts that just as the Lord has delivered him from drowning, so he will restore fullness of life to Jonah. Is it possible that Jonah actually had died and actually had descended into the pit and that's where he was praying from? It is possible. And we're going to talk about that um, in a little while. But Jonah declares, I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay in Jonah chapter 2 verse 9. Indeed, Jonah's prayer itself is a sacrifice of thanksgiving. He realizes his state of humbleness in this world. He previously tried to run from God, but failed. He understands that when God calls, he must answer, and he vows to do so should God call him again. Jonah finishes his, um, up his prayer by boldly proclaiming, salvation belongs to the Lord in chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, this one sentence forms the theme of Jonah's book and the theme of all of the Bible. Salvation itself is God's possession. He freely bestows it. The Apostle Paul later unpacked that sentence when he wrote, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 9. Sometime after Jonah spoke his prayer, the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited him out. The experiences of Jonah foreshadow that of Jesus in some significant ways. First, just as Jonah offered his life for the salvation of the sailors caught in the deadly storm, Jesus will offer his life for the salvation of the world. The second point of comparison actually comes from the lips of Jesus himself. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 12, verse 40. Thirdly, 
Jesus' resurrection from the dead is typified by Jonah's resurrection from the fish. And then, so Matthew chapter 12, 38 through 40 says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. No sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So what exactly is the sign of Jonah? That is the big question in connection with um, this familiar text. Unfortunately, most of the attention is usually diverted to the lesser issue of the three days and three nights. And as a result, this particular passage in Matthew has managed to cause intense confusion, frustration, and even division among laymen and scholars alike. Jesus said that the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Assuming that in the heart of the earth means in the tomb, Jesus died Friday and rose Sunday. Uh, then we note that Jesus was not in the tomb three nights, even though the scripture distinctly states three nights. I have encountered people who, because of this apparent discrepancy, felt that the Bible just couldn't be trusted. I've known others who, in a court, um, who in order to accommodate the three nights mentioned in this verse adopted the theory that Jesus died on Wednesday or Thursday. Others reasoned that Jesus did not really mean three literal nights. And frankly, it makes me sad to see Christians expend so much energy struggling to explain something that the Bible clearly explains itself. The problem is not in the three days and three nights at all. The problem springs from our misunderstanding of the phrase in the heart of the earth. This reminds me of a similar experience that uh, the Millerite Christians went through over 150 years ago when they anticipated the coming of Christ in 1844. Their belief was based upon the scripture in, da um, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, that states, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now the Millerites located the starting point of this prophecy, which was in 457 BC in Daniel 9.25, um, from the going forth of the command to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. By adding 2,300 prophetic days, a day in a prophecy equals a year, according to Ezekiel 4.6, they calculated that Jesus would come in 1844 because obviously the earth must be the sanctuary that was to be cleansed by fire. Well, when Jesus did not come, the Millerites tried to find the error in their time reckoning. Many continued refigurating um, the data, when in reality the problem was not with the time but with the place. Nowhere in the Bible is the earth called the sanctuary. It did not mean the earth. The problem was not in their calculation of time. It was in the meaning of the word sanctuary. Jesus was not coming to cleanse the earth with fire in 1844. He did, however begin a special work as our high priest to cleanse the sanctuary in heaven from the sins of his people. Daniel 8, 12 through 14, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 through 6, and Leviticus chapter 16, verses 1 through 17. It was also at this time that Christ began to cleanse his sanctuary or church on earth of the false doctrines that had taken a hold during the dark ages. Whenever we question the meaning of a passage of scripture, we must compare it with other related passages and allow the Bible to interpret itself. Since the term heart of the earth is found only in Matthew chapter 12 and nowhere else in scripture, we will need to look at a similar or related verses. The phrase in the earth appears 66 times in the King James Version. Not one of those references refers to the grave. In the Lord's Prayer, when we pray, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, does that mean we're praying for God's will to be done in the tomb or the grave as it is in heaven? No. No, of course not. It means among the people of earth, the nations of the earth, as, as it is done among the angels in heaven. In the second commandment, we read, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness or of anything that is in heaven above 
or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Exodus 20 verse 4. We can easily recognize that in the earth beneath does not mean in the grave or tomb, but rather in the world. Again, Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5.5. 5. Does that mean that they will inherit the tomb or the grave? I think you get my point. In Matthew 12.40, the word heart comes from the Greek word cardia, which is how we get the word cardiac. According to Strong's Concordance, the word cardia means the heart. In other words, the thoughts or feelings. Um, also the middle. The Greek word for earth is G. Or it's pronounced gay. G-H-A-Y. Um, it means soil, a region, or the solid part... <sighs> The solid part or the whole of the Turin globe, including the occupants in such application, country, ground, land, world. So the phrase in the heart of the earth can easily be translated in the midst of the world or in the grip of this lost planet Jesus came to save. So in other words, the Lord was telling his disciples in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, that as Jonah was in the belly of the great the great fish, so the Son of Man would be in the heart of the earth. Notice that Jonah was not stationary in the fish as with a dead person in a tomb. Rather, he was mobile, um, living, a living captive to go wherever the fish took him. When the fish went up, he went up. And when the fish went down, he went down. In like manner, Jesus was a captive of the devil he was completely in the control of a demon-inspired mob that took him from place to place, heaping abuse, insult, and physical punishment upon our Redeemer. When he suffered the punishment and penalty for our sins, he was in the heart or the midst of this lost world. The life of Jesus was marked by several pivotal moments. When he turned 12 in Jerusalem, he became aware of his life calling and special relationship with the Father. At his baptism, Jesus began his life and public ministry and preaching. But when exactly were the sins of the world placed upon the Lamb of God? Was it when he died upon the cross? Or when they laid his body in the grave? No. That was part of paying the penalty for sin, but by that time his suffering had ended. Was it perhaps when they drove the nails into his hands? And that was certainly part of it. But the starting point was before the crucifixion. Jesus began bearing our guilt, our shame, and our penalty after he prayed that prayer of surrender for the third time in the Garden of Gethsemane. On that Thursday evening, Jesus prayed in agony, sweating great drops of blood. He said, not my will, but thine be done. Luke 22, 42 through 44. From that moment on, Christ was fulfilling his destiny as the guilt bearer for the fallen race. The mob came and carried him away. Jesus was a captive of a captive of the devil. His his communion was heaven with heaven was severed. It was severed. Um, the cord that had always linked him to his father was cut by the scissors of one sin. He was in the depths of the world. There are five Bible verses in which Jesus refers to Thursday evening as the hour. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto him, Sleep now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Matthew 26, 45. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Mark 14, 41. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Luke 22, 14. Behold, the hour cometh. Yeah, yea, is, is now come that ye shall be scattered every man to his own and shall leave me alone. John 16, 32. Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. John 17, verse 1. According to Hebrew law, 
The sins of the people were to be placed upon the Passover lamb before it was slain. During the Last Supper, with the bread and grape juice, with the bread and wine. I know churches like to give out grape juice, um, but it was wine. Let's not pretend. <laughs> um, Jesus sealed his new covenant to be the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. A marked change took place the hour Christ was betrayed into the hands of sinners, or we might better say into the hands of the devil. Something different began to happen. You see, before this point in Jesus' ministry, every time a mob tried to capture or stone him or cast him off a cliff, he passed unharmed right through their fingers. This was because he was innocent before the Father and under the divine angelic protection. His hour had not yet come. It was not yet his time to suffer for the sins of the world. But after that hour, Thursday evening, when the past, present, and future sins of the world were placed upon the Lamb of God, it was then time. From the moment he began bearing the penalty for our sins, Jesus was in the heart of the earth. The crowd beat him. They spat upon him. He was dragged from one trial to another. From the high priest to Pilate, then to Herod, and back to Pilate, he was in the clutches of this evil world, the clutches of the devil who is the prince of this world. Imagine how Jonah must have suffered during his ordeal as a captive in the midst of the great fish. Three days in that slimy, stench-filled darkness must have seemed like an eternity. Have you considered that if Jonah could survive alive, in that fish's digestive abyss, he may not have been the only creature still alive and squirming around in there. Of course, we're going to talk about how maybe he wasn't even alive, but we don't know. <sighs> Questions. Questions when we meet the prophets of old in heaven. I think we're going to learn a lot. Um, and those questions will be answered. But... The suffering of our Lord was infinitely greater than that of the wayward prophet. How much Jesus must love us to willingly endure all that in order to spare us the, mis the miserable fate of the lost. So as we look again at our Bible text, we understand that Jesus was in the heart of the earth, the grip of the enemy, over a period of three days and three nights, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night. Jesus never said that it would be three 24-hour segments, but rather over a period of three days and three nights. There are many other ways in which Jonah was a type of Christ. You remember, of course, that just like Jesus, Jonah's, Jonah was asleep in a boat in the midst of a storm. Jonah instructed the sailors to throw him overboard if they would survive and have, and, and, and have peace. I offered one I, I I often wondered why Jonah didn't just why didn't he just jump overboard? If he had, the sailors would not have had to personally take responsibility and offer him. He could have washed their hands just by jumping over overboard. But like like Jesus, Jonah too was a willing sacrifice. The wrath of God was upon all those doomed sailors, and Jonah took the wrath by offering himself in the same way. We must personally take Jesus and offer his blood as our sacrifice in order to pass from death to life and have that peace that passes understanding. Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now notice the similarities. Between Jonah's prayer from the fish and the prophetic prayer of the Messiah on the cross. Jonah chapter 2 verse 3. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods encompassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Psalm 69 chapter 2. I mean, Psalm chapter 69 verse 2. I sink in the deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. Jonah prayed by faith from the bowels of that sea monster and believed that the Lord 
could hear him in spite of the evidence of his sense, um, of his senses, I mean, that he was help hopelessly separated from God. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again towards the holy temple. Jonah chapter 2 verse 4. In like manner, when Jesus sensed the awful separation from his father during his ordeal on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mark 15, 34. Then by faith he reached up into the heavenly temple and prayed, Father, into thy hands I commend, I commend my spirit. Luke 23, 46. This was a tremendous act of faith, as Christ was bearing the incomprehensible guilt and sins of a lost world and felt the eternal separation from his Father. Many think that the sign of Jonah was the three days and three nights. But notice in the Gospel of Luke that when referring to the sign of Jonah, Jesus never mentions the time period at all. The emphasis of Christ is rather on the way his people rejected his ministry, preaching, and prophecy in comparison with the Ninevites who received and repented at the preaching of Jonah. Jonah. Luke eleven twenty nine 29 through 32 records, and when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto the, the Ninevites, so shall also the son of man be to this generation. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. After Jonah came out of the water, it took him three days to reach the city of Nineveh. He then entered the city one day's journey or 12 hours and preached that after 40 days, the city would be destroyed. Jonah chapter three, verse three and four. This same time sequence of three and one half followed by 40 is also found elsewhere in the scripture. For example, Elijah ministered for three and one half years during the famine and then fled for 40, day, um, for 40 days from Jezebel. 1 Kings 19, 1 through 8. In like manner, Jesus came up from the waters of baptism and preached to the Jews for three and one half years warning that in one generation or 40 years, the city and the temple would be destroyed. Matthew 12, 41. Because the nation of Israel did not listen and repent, it was destroyed. Only a small percentage of the Jewish people accepted him and were ready. Could this happen again to the church, um, to the church today? Many are the ways in which Jonah was a sign or a type of Christ. The principal sign of Jesus to his people was his resurrection. Then answered the Jews and said, and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou dost these things, doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But he spoke of the temple of his body. John, 12, um, John chapter 2, 18 through 21. In the same way, the sign of Jonah to the Ninevites was that God had in figure raised him from certain death. No doubt Jonah, like Jesus, bore scars from his ordeal. As Jonah went down the streets of Nineveh preaching, his, his skin could very well have been bleached and raw, covered with bits of dry seaweed. seaweed. Um, there have been at least three examples in modern times where people were swallowed by some type of large fish and were later rescued alive. The reports were that their skin was burnt and pale. And I'm sure Jonah shared uh, with his audience the highlights of his adventure and the, the virtual resurrection from certain death. I mean, he told people, he told somebody, come on. Can you imagine how much, how, 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 how badly he must have smelled? <sighs> Today, every real Christian has, like Jonah, experienced a type of resurrection and new life. Romans 6, 4, we are each called to go where God sends us without consulting our, um, consulting our fears and to preach a message of mercy and warning. Yet much of the Christian church um, is turning away from modern Jonas. 
Still today, there are those who will not believe unless they see signs and wonders, healings and miracles. Even the signs that we're seeing, they want more. Looking for proof. Prove to me that God is real. The proof is here. It's everywhere. It's all around us. If I see it for myself, then I'll believe it. The fact is you are seeing all of this for yourself. You just aren't picking up your Bible. You're not connecting what's happening in the world to what Jesus told us would be happening in these days. The sign Jesus gave to his generation is still valid today. For three days and nights, he took the punishment through suffering and the penalty through death. Then he rose again from the jaws of the grave. He defeated Satan. He defeated death. And most important of all, Jesus gave us he, his eternal word to guide us to the kingdom. Christ said, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will, be the, will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. In Luke 16, 31. Um, there might be some Jonas listening to this video right now. Maybe God's called you to um, share the gospel, but you are fleeing to Tarshish on a stormy sea. <sighs> Don't do that. The Bible is a complex and intricate work that spans across multiple books, genres, and time periods. Yet despite the differences in style and content, there are often striking similarities and connections between various parts of the Bible. One such connection can be found in um, the Old Testament and the New Testament in the Gospels. The book of Jonah tells the story of a reluctant prophet who is called by God to preach to the people of Nineveh. Jonah's story is amazing, but did Jonah survive? Well, this is what I think. I've been teasing you, and this may be possible, although we can never know, but I'm going to say no and yes. So let's read Jonah's part of the prayer from the whale's belly. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish, and he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. Jonah chapter 2, verse 3. Um, let's consider these three key points. First, the phrases belly of Sheol and the pit are Old Testament terms that refer to the realms of the dead. Look at Job chapter 7 verse 9, chapter 33 verse 18, Psalm chapter 40 verse 2, uh, Psalm 49 verse 14 through 15, and Psalm 89 verse 48. Secondly, the Hebrews say that his soul or Nefesh fainted, meaning he took his last breath like a dying man. And lastly, when God says to Jonah, arise, this is the Hebrew word. Um, it's the same word that Jesus used when he raised Lazarus. Um, I'm sorry, when he raised Jairus's, Jairus's daughter from the dead. Mark 5, 41 reads, taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Tabitha, uh, tell, telleth a kern, which translated means little girl, I tell to you, get up. So actually, the atheists have a good point. Jonah probably did die in the belly of the great fish or whale. 
God had mercy on him and raised him from the dead, and he was able to carry out his mission. This would be a sign of the resurrection, another foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Okay, so where am I going with this? Remember when Jesus refused to give the Pharisees a sign? What was his reply? He said an evil, adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Matthew twelve thirty-eight through 41 Now, to be honest, I've thought before that this was a very weak parallel. No offense um, to Jesus, of course. But the story makes much more sense if Jonah really did give up the ghost, only to be miraculously revived to preach to the Ninevites. And there's even more, like, why are the Ninevites so significant? Throughout Old Testament history, Nineveh was not a friend of Israel. In the late 7th century BC, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. The city's king, um, Sennacherib, laid siege to Jerusalem in 701 BC. Um, 2 Kings 18, verse 13 through um, chapter 19, verse 37. And I'm sure the Jews never forgot. When the Babylonians destroyed Nineveh in 612, Nahum the prophet practically rejoiced. He calls Nineveh the city of bloodshed. Nahum chapter 3 verse 1. Jonah probably fled because of these reasons. Like many Jews of his time, Jonah hated Nineveh. By, by mentioning Jonah, Jesus was being purposely provocative. His death would lead not only to his resurrection, but the repentance of the pagan nations that his audience would have despised. The sign of Jonah wasn't just his resurrection, but would lead to the repentance of those hated Gentiles. Now think about this for a second. From Augustine to, Aqu to Aquinas, Christian apologists would point to the success of the church as evidence of the truth of the gospel. When they argued for the messiahship, divinity, and resurrection of Jesus, they generally failed to mention the evidence for an empty tomb or the reliability of the eyewitnesses. They didn't argue about historical probability and evidence, as important as I think that is. Um, rather, they simply pointed out to the crumbling pagan world around them. Gentile nations that had worshipped idols for a millennia miraculously repented, turned and began to worship God, the God of the Jews. Isaiah the prophet also saw this when he said that the servant of the Lord will be a light for the nations. Isaiah 42, 6 through 7. Many of the psalmists um, and Old Testament prophets predicted the same thing, that one day Israel would lead to the conversion of the nations. Now look around. Since Jesus' death and resurrection, a tiny band of Jewish vagabond fishermen turned the world upside down, and their effect has been felt for generations until now. In the first century, Christianity spread throughout Europe, North Africa, and Western Asia, and more recently has spread throughout Africa, South America, and even in communist China. Christianity still has a stronghold in North America, as well as parts of Europe, and over the past two millennia, billions and billions of non-Jews have repented and worshipped the God of Israel. So this atheist um, point of view makes a good point. Of course, Jonah wouldn't have survived. Jonah died, rose again three days later, and his preaching converted the Ninevites. Jesus died, rose again three days later, and his message through his apostles converted billions of Gentiles over the past 2,000 years. The sign of Jonah has been fulfilled. We don't believe that simply because a book says it's true, that we can just open our eyes and see the world around us. The dramatic repentance of Nineveh in Jonah chapter 3, 1 through 10, may have been galvanized by a total solar eclipse um, there that dates to June 15th, 763 BCE, during the probable lifetime of Jonah. All sorts of details kick in to make this possibility highly plausible. 
a total solar eclipse over Nineveh in northern Iraq on June 15th, 763 BCE fits this time frame for the life and the career of Jonah. According to the Assyrian writings cited by Wiseman, here's what a solar eclipse would have meant to them. The king will be deposed and killed, and a worthless fellow will seize the throne. Rain from heaven rain from heaven will flood the land. The city walls will be destroyed. The Assyrians tell us that at such time there would be sol um, solemn fasting, and the king would hand over his throne to a substitute until the danger passed. At least once, when there was a, um, was a total solar eclipse, the Assyrians cry, Nineveh shall be overthrown which can also mean Nineveh shall be made to repent. I believe that Jonah was in Nineveh in June of 763 BC during the total eclipse of the sun, which would help explain the remarkable response of the people of Nineveh. Jonah preaches at exactly the right time for the people of Nineveh to listen to him. The Assyrian nation was weak and in chaos in the decade um, around 760 BCE. They had one earthquake, one sign of divine, uh, divine wrath. Um, there was a famine from 765 to 758 BCE. And Assyria was losing battles and losing territory to its enemies. There, was a there were domestic riots. With all the trouble that they already had going on, they could have easily believed that Jonah's warning would come to pass. Now was the perfect time for a prophet from far away to arrive on the scene and command a response. The repentance of an entire pagan city the size of Nineveh would be a greater miracle than for Jonah to survive getting swallowed by a fish. Oh, by the way, I have no problem with that part of the account either. Um, yes, such an experience would be near fatal, if not fatal, but that's part of the miracle, which is probably why Jesus cites Jonah as a sign compared to his own resurrection, a sign that will still require some time in the future to those who heard Jesus at first. We are in no position to prove or disprove either Jonah's survival inside the fish or the repentance of Nineveh, nor can we prove the admittedly daring hypothesis that Jonah was there for the 763 BCE eclipse and that the eclipse helped produce the results recorded in the biblical account. But if these propositions are not provable, they are at least perfectly plausible. Yet they do not remove the element of the divine. When can you get God to send a stupendous natural event right when you need one to back up your point? The divine factor is why I doubt whether anyone will be moved to repentance by the eclipse in 2024. God will have to use other means to make that happen on any scale like the repentance recorded in Nineveh at the time of Jonah, Jesus' resurrection, the mega event foreshadowed by Jonah's brush with death inside the great fish will do the job. Um, if anything can. And we have far stronger reason to believe in the truth of Jesus' resurrection than in what happened in Nineveh as a result of the eclipse of 763 BCE, a solar eclipse where the moon comes between the sun and the earth, throwing us into, um, throwing us here on earth in, into shadow. So in Jonah, we have the story most of us are probably familiar with. Jonah chapter 1, 1 through 2, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amite, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah panics, not wanting to be the bearer of bad news, and runs the other way. God sends a storm, and Jonah volunteers to be tossed overboard, gets swallowed by a fish, and is there three days and nights until he prayed. Then he goes to do the job that God had first commanded and tells Nineveh of their soon-to-be destruction in 40 days, but something totally unexpected happens. Jonah chapter 3, 5 through 10. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the, to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes he issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water, both 
um, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. This is great stuff. Um, they repented, and God spared them. So you're probably asking, what is the eclipse connection? Well, it turns out that Nineveh is believed to have been primed for the message of Jonah. <sighs> Cuneiform tablets were found in the 19th century, and they describe what is known as the Versageli eclipse, verified by NASA as occurring on June 15th. There was a plague so bad that the king was not able to go to war, as was their custom, followed by a civil war and another plague. By the time Jonah got there, they had to realize that this must be the answer as to why they were having all of these problems. They didn't make excuses. They bucked up and showed God that they were willing as a nation to change and follow him. Luke chapter 21, verse 25 and 28. There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on earth, dismay among nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Could the eclipse of 2024 be one of those signs? It's been said that on average, a total solar eclipse can be seen from the same place on Earth only once every 375 years. And yet within seven years, this area um, in Missouri can see two eclipses. Could the sign be that judgment is coming for the United States if we don't repent? Little Egypt is going to see two, has seen two eclipses within seven years. But in that case, where does that leave us? First Peter 1.13 Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. I have one. Um, I want to share just a little bit more about this eclipse. Um, I'm going to... If you're still with me at this point, um, there's a couple more things about this eclipse that I didn't mention in the beginning of this video. Like the fact that April 8th is a new moon. And that's interesting because the new moon is just a sliver, the very first sighting of the sliver of the moon. And yet we're going to see a total full um, full moon during the day, during this eclipse, because the moon is going to, you're going to see the full moon during the day, and it's going to block out the sun, causing darkness. And then at night, it's a new moon. It's just a sliver. So it's going to be very dark during the night. Um, now, something I find very interesting is, you know, people don't, Talking about New Babylon, um, the Bible, chapter uh, Revelation, chapter 18, verse 4 through 5. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. So this part, come out of her, my people. I have been very recently thinking that this isn't um, telling you to come out of a to come out of a church or out of a. I believe that what we're seeing in Israel, the war, um, not just the war, but God has been calling His people, the chosen people, the Jews, back to Israel. They are going back to Israel. This nation, um, this the people are just, the people are being called home to their promised land, to Israel. And um, many, was I, I feel like there's about like 7,000 Jews here in America. And I think that this verse here may be saying, come out of my people. He's calling them back home. 
before so that they won't partake in the wrath of God that's about to fall on this world. Now, what does that mean for Christians? The Israels are being called home. Get out, come out of her, my people. I think this is a dual interpretation. I believe that the Jews are being called home to Israel. They haven't accepted Jesus as the Messiah yet. They're going to. The um, seven-year tribulation that's coming is the um, one of the main reasons is to bring Israel back to God, to the true God, and to show them um, that Jesus was is their Messiah, and they're going to accept him, and they're going to learn um, during this very difficult period of time that's coming on the earth. Now, for Christians today, this is um, come out of my people. We're going to be taken. The Christians are going in the rapture. Um, can you imagine what these eclipses are? I mean, the last final warning from God before perhaps... For, you know, 40 days before Pentecost, perhaps uh, we're going to be seeing some great earthquakes um, destroying America. And if the Jews, God's chosen people, want to escape the sins of this nation, they need to come out of her and they need to go home back to Israel where God has planned for them and a purpose for them. And the Christian church, those the children of God are going to be called out of America and not just America, of course. We're talking about the whole world, but as far as this verse goes, um, we're going to be called out to meet Jesus in the clouds and we will be leaving. And can you imagine the devastation if these um, fault lines that we've already discussed, if, if we happen to have a great, great earthquake, unlike anything America's seen before, devastating and catastrophic, um, and then add to that the chaos that the rapture is going to cause. This is going to be a great event when the children of God are called out of the world. We need to be prepared. We need to heed the warning, the warning of God. Titus chapter 2, 11 through 13 says, For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. John 14, 1 through 3 says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's interesting. Jesus is in heaven, preparing a place for us in his father's house. At the rapture, He's going to come and receive us onto him so that where he is, heaven, that's where we will be with him in heaven. There would be no reason to prepare a place for us if we weren't going there. If the second coming, at the end of the tribulation, Jesus comes down and he starts, um, he reigns on the earth for 1,000 years. We're going to be with him for that too because we are going to be with him wherever he is. But there would be no reason for us to for him to prepare a place for us in his father's house if he wasn't going to be taking us there. <sighs> Jesus is coming and he's coming soon. Why Why would God judge America so harshly? What have we done that's so bad? What about the millions, 75, 79 million abortions? Let's just start there. The shedding of the innocent blood. Our hands are bloody. We are guilty. And I have discussed this in a previous video. Go back and check out some of my, you know, other videos. If you want more information than I've given you. But this is the most up-to-date that I have. But yeah, America's guilty. Look at what we're doing to our children today. We're trying to change their identities. That's one of the first things that the Babylonians did when they conquered um, Jerusalem. When they destroyed Jerusalem, the, they took the young boys and they changed their names. 
and they instructed them in the ways of their gods, their idols. Don't get so caught up with the world that you're not seeing what's happening in the world. Keep your ear to the ground. Keep your eyes on the Lord. The scriptures are telling us what's coming. And um, don't, don't keep your head buried in the sand. This is a sign from God. It, there's no way it could be anything else. You can call it all coincidence, but you're lying to yourself and you know it. If you're really looking at what is happening with this coming eclipse, with the um, with what's happening in the world today, with, I mean, it's, it, I don't see how you could reach any other conclusion. It's obvious. God is warning us. And this isn't a warning only for the United States. This is a warning for the world. So if you don't know Jesus, now is the time to get to know him. Do not be left behind. What is going to happen after this eclipse? I don't know. But we're seeing a warning from God. Is the rapture, as I said, is the rapture going to happen during the eclipse? That would be amazing. Could you imagine? Could you imagine the Christians being taken during the eclipse? What that would tell the world? What kind of a sign would that be for the world? Of course, then we're not here to point you to Jesus. We're not here to tell you what these things possibly may mean and what they do mean. What happens if this does set up a great earthquake that devastates the United States? I mean, could you imagine Yellowstone blowing? And not just Yellowstone. We've got some pretty big fault lines going on here an active volcano, two incredible fault lines, the crack, I mean, just look at, look at where this eclipse is passing, the 2017 and 2024 eclipses, you've got the signature of God across America, the Alf and the Tav, he signed this work, he, this is from God, he signed it, don't be fooled, don't be deceived, We're running out of time to warn you. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine what this world, what, what America is going to be like once the church is raptured? You don't believe in the rapture? You think it's going to be later? I don't think so. I think it's the next great black swan event. And I think that the leaders of this country are preparing for it. They are building bunkers. They are um, giving us this great UFO deception so that they they ha they have their storyline all laid out already. They're already share it, spreading it. But remember, these are not al these aliens are not from another planet. They are demons from another dimension, which the Bible talks about. Put on the full armor of God, so that you can withstand the lies of the devil. Stand, believe, trust in God. Put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and in him alone, whether you believe in the rapture or not, that's not even as important. That's not even a salvational issue. What is a salvational issue is who are you trusting to, for, to, to take your sins away? Yourself? You think that your good works will weigh the balance? No, only the blood of Jesus can save you from what is coming. And it's better to come to him now than later. If you can't live for Jesus today, how are you going to die for him tomorrow in the tribulation when the church is raptured and all of a sudden you believe? And are you going to believe? There will be a great deception. A great deception. And most of us believe that that will be the alien, the lie that the aliens came and took the Christians to reprogram them to their way of thinking because we are not because we're not with their program and so we'll come back they say yeah we will come back with Jesus who we left with they're not aliens they're demons don't be deceived and if you are left here after the rapture do not take the mark there will be no salvation for anyone who takes the mark you would be better giving your life for Christ 
because eternity is a very long time. The seven year tribulation that's going to fall on this earth is nothing. It's not even a drop of, in the water. It's not even one drop in the water of eternity. Don't do it. But trust in Jesus today and you won't have to be here for that time. Put your faith and your trust in him. Pray. Read your Bible. <sighs> Come to Jesus. We're running out of time to warn you. I'm, I mean, we say this and you just blow us off. The mockers and the scoffers, which the Bible told us would be here today, they're here. Look at the world around you. Do your homework. And trust in Jesus because I want to see you in heaven.